in Genesis chapter 34, we left off at verse 11. Genesis 34, 11. And Shechem said unto her father and unto her brethren, Let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me, I will give. So Shechem, after uh, the... After the rape of Dina, he wants to marry this girl, you might recall, and he says to Dina's father and Dina's family that he beseeches, basically he requests and begs them that he would find grace in their sight. They would find grace with him and that whatever they say to him, He'll be sure to give it to them, whatever request or favor they ask or say, whatever their demands are, he will follow. In verse 12, ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as he shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. You'll notice right here that she come, he tells him to ask uh, there is never so much dowry in other words i can give it as much as you want the dowry and the gift for the marriage ask me as much as you want and i will make sure that i will give it according to your statement what you request to me but give me the damsel to wife but make sure that you give me that a young girl as my wife, if I'm going to give you this much dowry. In verse 13, And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamer his father deceitfully. So the sons of Jacob, they respond to Shechem and Hamor, his own fa uh, Shechem's father. But when they answer him, they do it craftily. They do it with deception. So they trick him. And this is what they said, because he had defiled Dina, their sister. Because Dina, their sister, has been defiled, corrupted by Shechem's actions, they decide to answer him with deception. Now, the question here is that Shechem was speaking to the father and the brethren at verse 11, you might notice. But then the sons of Jacob are the ones who answer. So then the father is suddenly gone for some weird reason. And another question is this. Another question is that there was no doubt she confronted the whole family because we see right here that at verse 5, they were approaching Jacob and the family. Verse 7, the sons of Jacob, they were grieved. So then what in the world is going on here? So it could be that the sons of Jacob right here are referring to Simeon and Levi. It can refer to Simeon and Levi, not necessarily all the brothers who answered deceitfully. Because if you look at verse 25, the main attention of this whole passage of the deception is Simeon and Levi in verse 25. Those are the specific sons of Jacob. Also, if you look at verse 27, if 25 is Simeon and Levi who spoiled the city, notice verse 27, the Bible calls them the sons of Jacob, right? So if we go back to verse 13, the sons of Jacob could be referring to Simeon and Levi. So in other words, in verse 11, Shechem talks to the father and the whole people. Why? Because if he wants to marry this girl, he has to speak to the whole clan, so to speak. He has to speak to everybody. But then what happens later on is either J they were caught with uh, Jacob doing his own business, or maybe... Simeon and Levi, they were able to take Shechem and Haman, his father, uh, Hamor, excuse me, his father aside. Something happened in between. But the point is, the father had no knowledge of it 
The reason why we know this is because the father would have stopped them and the father was in shock about everything that happened at verse 30. If you look at verse 30, Jacob, he did not approve of the actions and what happened. So he would have stopped them. So somehow, someway, Simeon and Levi were able to get Shechem and Hamar, his father, aside, whatever happened in between. You'll also notice that at verse 13, it was done in deception. Where did Simeon and Levi learn to be tricky? So there is no doubt that Jacob's actions right here, let me know if I'm out of bounds, okay? So Jacob's sin truly caught up to him. And Jacob, by going his own direction to worship God, do you remember that? He was going to worship God. He was going to keep his promise like many of you would do as well. But you won't do it by God's terms. You have your own way of worshiping God. By going in your own direction, notice right here, God doesn't have to punish you or chastise you. If you don't go by God's terms, you got to realize that something bad will happen. That's why it's so important to follow God's will. You might say, why should I? Because bad things could happen. But if you, there's no place safer than in God's hand, so why not stay there? But if you get outside of God's hand, God don't really have to judge you back to get back into his hand. It's your own doing that causes harm. So the reason why God wants you to follow his will is for your own safety, for your own good. So a lot of you have to think about that. If you are afraid to follow God, you shouldn't be. You should be afraid to follow yourself. You don't know what your decisions, what kind of, what's going to happen next week or even tomorrow from the actions you make that don't follow God's will. So know this, that God only tells you to do these things for your own safety, for your own good. So when we return to this passage right here, Jacob, there's no doubt that his sin caught up to him. So Jacob, he reaped what he sowed. He tricked his brother Esau at the previous chapter. He never got rid of that habit. So Simeon and Levi saw all of that, what his, their father did. Oh, wow, our father is clever. He was able to trick him so that he can get what he wants. We can do the same thing too. You got to realize children watch what you do. So because children watch what you do, hey, Jacob, your kids are following your example and they might make some kind of sin or tragedy in the future and they just only followed what you did. So it's so important that you got to watch out on your actions and you got to follow God's will. So we see right here that Dina got defiled. That's his reaping and sowing. And then his sons were able to pick up the bad habit and trick others as well. But what children follow from their parents, they tend to do in excess. That's why it's so important to Watch out for your sin and to follow God's will. If you don't do that, then what's going to happen is children will do it even more in excess. Uh, they'll do even more so than what you do. Yeah. So if you look at this passage, they're not done tricking. You're going to see the uh, horrendous tragedy that happens. Uh, before I continue on, one more passage to prove that we can see that the sons of Levi would refer to only uh, Simeon. The sons of Jacob, excuse me, would refer to only Simeon and Levi. If we go to the book of Genesis, chapter uh, 49. Genesis 49. And then verse 5 and 6. Notice that what Simeon and Levi did was done in secret. So not everyone was involved. People in Jacob's family didn't really know about this. So we can see right here, it seems to show that Simeon and Levi are those sons of Jacob who concocted all this and not all of Jacob's uh, family or his people. But you never know, they could possibly be involved, 
but I'm just simply going by the verses as best as I can on explaining this passage on how it happened. If we look at Genesis 49, verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their what? Secret. So it's something they kept. And Jacob is referring to Simeon and Levi, what they did against Shechem's people. If you keep reading, unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and their self-will they dig down a wall. So they killed Shechem and his people, that you're going to find out when we go back to Genesis 34. Very clever, their statement. Verse 14, And they said unto them, We cannot do this thing, to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised. So Simeon and Levi say to Shechem and Hamor that we can't do this thing. We can't fulfill your request in giving Dina to you to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised. We can't give our sister to a person that has not circumcised himself yet. Now, remember that when we go back to the book of Genesis, that God's people, Abraham's lineage, are all circumcised. That was an important thing that Abraham had to do. So, in verse 14, they're arguing that you have to be circumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. In other words, uh, if you're uncircumcised, it's a reproach to us. It's a disgrace. It's very disrespectful. But in this will we consent unto you. So in other words, in this part, what we're about to say, we will consent to your request. If ye will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised, then will we give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. So in other words, remember, I'm going to be explaining each and every word uh, from these verses. So they basically said, if you're going to be like us, in other words, if, you, if every male in your city in your people, get circumcised, then we'll give our own daughters to you. So we're going to give our women, uh, any uh, girls that are born from our family in the future that become our daughters, we're going to hand them over to you. So it's a future thing. And we're going to take your daughters for ourselves as well. We'll live with you and we'll become one people together. But if ye will not hearken unto us, to be circumcised, then will we take our daughter and we will be God. So Simeon and Levi said, if you're not going to listen, if you're not going to hearken to us to be circumcised, then we're going to take our daughter and leave. So remember that phrase, our daughter. Simeon and Levi are not saying that Dina, their sister, is their daughter, but that's a word as a collective phrase uh, referring to their people. There's always a community mindset with the Semites, especially during the ancient times. So uh, everyone is pretty much brother, sister, etc. So they all, uh, basically everyone is a collective community together. So the community's daughter is Dina. That's the idea. So don't be surprised on that one. It's the same thing with grandfather. The Bible never says that, but it's referring to in the biblical word father. So don't be surprised about that. In verse 18, and their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. And the young man deferred not to do the thing because he had delight in Jacob's daughter. So the words that Simeon and Levi stated to Hamor and Shechem, who is Hamor's son, pleased them. So they're going to follow their demands. So Shechem, who is the young man, he 
dare not to uh, prevent in performing the task of circumcision. That's the idea of deferred. So it's, in other words, to avoid. He's going to make sure that he's not going to avoid. He will perform it. Because he delighted, he obviously had an inclination toward Jacob's daughter, Dina. And he was more honorable than all the house of his father. So he was even more honorable than everybody in his father's house. So notice right here again, for the young women in verse 19, this guy sounds like a very noble person. He can even be honorable, but he is no more than a crud, okay? He is no more than a piece of dirt. So don't be deceived by she comes out there. So it's very important that you young women don't get defiled by a bunch of she comes out there. Okay. So avoid that because all they do is that they're corrupting you and they're corrupting your walk with God. Right. And it also brings hurt to the family. It's, uh, romance and young love can be a very selfish thing. It goes by impulse. Right. Never go by that. Right. You uh, don't think about your family. And you don't care if the guy is, uh, has some shady things himself because all you see is his good points. And then go after 10 years in marriage and let's see what happens to his honor, to his romantic side, to his good points. He only showed you that side. Okay? He only did that to, excuse me, but to get in your pants. Now, I'm saying all this because it is a true statement and it's something that uh, young women and not just women, but also men as well should keep in their minds because this is such a fornicating society that anything goes. This is part of normal life. All right. One thing I hate about our culture here is we normalize too many things that we don't think as sin, as something serious. So that's why I have to speak very hard on that. Okay, um, let's go back to, uh, to verse 20 now, okay? And Hamor and Shechem his son came unto the gate of their city and communed with the men of their city, saying, so Hamor and Shechem, who is Hamor's son, they go to the gate of the city. Usually the gate of the city is where you judge matters or you give some public statements. It's like a city meeting. So the gate of the cities are usually important. So they communicated with the males in the city because they have to get circumcised, obviously. And they said to the men in verse 21, these men are peaceable with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade therein for the land. So basically he's saying that these men, referring to Jacob and the people, they're very peaceable with us. That's why uh, let them live in our land. Let them also do trade, business therein. So in this land, that's the idea. For the land, behold, it is large enough for them. So the land is big enough for everybody. So we can let them in. Let us take their daughters to us for wives and let us give them our daughters. So let's let allow them to take, uh, so let us, so we're going to take their daughters for ourselves, for our wives, and we're going to give them our daughters as well so they can marry our women. Only herein will the men consent unto us for to dwell with us to be one people. So only here in this part, the men are going to consent, are going to grant our request where they can live with us to become one people together. If every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised, the condition is every male uh, among us are going to be circumcised just like, those, uh, just like Jacob and those people are circumcised shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours. So he's saying this, note this, this is very important, especially for immigration politics. Won't their cattle, so their livestock, and all their possessions, that's their substance, and every beast, so every animal that they own, become ours. 
So it's not a matter of this, uh, uh, this land is my land, this land is your land. No, the thing about immigration, everyone wants a selfish catch to it. Democrats don't do this out of love for people. No, they want to get more votes in. The more immigrants that they sympathize with and then the floods that they allow in, the more votes that they get. And then the immigrants as well, when they come in, this is not to say all immigrants, but there are immigrants who come in as a selfish gain where, hey, I want to change the belief and the demographic and the culture of this population. Literally, America is a crumbling nation all built by greed from both sides, victim and elitist. Now, if you don't have the eyes open to see that one, you're totally blind because uh, you got to realize that every single person has a sinful nature, victim or elitist. Everyone has that. Uh, What's the evidence? Look at yours. Look at your nature, what you have the tendency to do. You have the tendency... Uh, Don't get me wrong, if there's, uh, look, my uh, family immigrated over here and I understand that. But to simply leave it right there and not put a boundary line and think that, so let's let everybody in. No, uh, you're stark raving mad because you have to realize that, sure, there are people out there that you want to help out and uh, do legal ways to immigrate or etc., and sure, the, uh, the policies here are pretty, uh, I looked at the studies and the policies of immigration. A lot of it you might think is just very extreme. But the, bound, uh, but the point is this. The point is to simply focus on the victimization without looking at the consequences or the sinful nature human side of it is totally amateurish and blind. Because... Underprivileged people, if you were ever underprivileged before, if you were ever suffering before, if you needed help before, you were glad you received help from people, but let's be honest, you tended to abuse it before. You tend to rely on that person a lot, uh, bug them with phone calls, grab more money, etc. You take advantage of people. If you're so blind that you don't see that, you don't know your own sinful nature that well. There's one thing that I've uh, learned what's very dangerous in church that you have to learn as well, because this does happen, and I've seen it, is that church is a community where we help each other out. Amen? Immigrant, poor, underprivileged. Amen? Yeah, amen. We are. But because we are known to be that, people take advantage of it, including ourselves, when we go through a low moment. Yeah, amen, amen, all right? I told you, I don't like this culture. It's too normalized, our thinking. So a lot of this is very shocking to us. But uh, if you don't believe me, just uh, look at your life carefully, look back in your life, look at people around you, and don't tell me there is not a single underprivileged person who never took advantage of you or took advantage of people. There will always be one. So am I saying not to help the underprivileged or the immigrants? No, but I'm saying at least put some kind of balance there. At least be wary at the same time. I don't, I want to help, but I don't want them to take advantage of it or to, be, or to abuse it. If you have that mentality, you will help them. There's one thing I noticed about helping church people is if I don't let them take advantage of me, I'm actually helping them. Because I finally let them learn that, hey, they've got to handle something themselves between them and God. And there's no better place of help than that. When God finally deals with you one-on-one and you stop relying on pastor so-and-so to be the God and Savior of everything in your life. Now, if uh, if you haven't experienced that, there are some people here who did. And they can be a witness of that. And I'm especially myself a witness of that. When I finally learned to let go and trust God, I received the help that I needed to stand on my own two feet rather than relying on people to always help me out. Okay, so going back over here. So there is something, there is a catch. You want to take advantage of it through immigration. Uh, The second part of verse 23, only let us consent unto them and they will dwell with us. So only provided that we just simply do 
uh, where we consent to their demands, and then they will live with us. Now, notice the fruits uh, when you uh, do immigration without a wariness. So I never said immigration is a sin, but I'm pointing out that when you have immigration without wariness, okay, without limitations, without caution, then here are several fruits that's going to happen. Go to number 17. Go to numbers... We're going to look at the book of Numbers, and then we'll look at chapter 17. Numbers chapter 17. Now, notice the fruits of people when they uh, do things what they want to do. In verse 5, in verse 5, the Lord warns that, and it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. Now notice right here that the children of Israel, that they were murmuring, right? They were not content. They were not happy with what God uh, did for them. So all they do is complain. But do you know where they uh, got the complaining attitude from? So true, they did get it from themselves, but it's because of a mingled group that was amongst them. So if we look back at chapter, if we go to chapter 20, if we look at chapter 20 right here, notice that the people, they complain again at verse 4. Uh, verse 3, excuse me. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? Now look at this next part. And wherefore have ye made us to come out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? So they're complaining about getting out of Egypt. So someone's enticing them to get back into Egypt. You notice that? Go to chapter 11. Chapter 11. And then I want you to go to the book of Exodus. I want you to go to the book of Exodus. And then we'll look at chapter... Uh, 12. Exodus 12 and Numbers 11. Exodus 12... And Numbers 11. Notice that the word of God reads at verse 4. And the what? Mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. Okay, who's, who's a mixed multitude? It's mixed is another word for integrated. See? Uh, keep your hand there. Go to Exodus 12. Keep your hand at Numbers. Go to Exodus 12. Look at verse 37, 37. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. So they leave Egypt, the Jews. But as the Jews leave Egypt, they're not alone. Verse 38, and a mixed multitude went up also with them. Notice that those Egyptians also went with the Jews. Why? Because they got nothing in Egypt. They know that what the Jews had, they have the goods. But Egypt was in ruins. So they want to immigrate. They want to live with the Jews so that they can get the goods from them. Now, the Bible shows right here concerning about uh, immigrants or sojourners, we are to treat them well. There are so many verses on that. So I am not against immigration. However, what I am against is when you just let everybody in without, oh, la di da they're all nice people. Yeah. Okay, you have to put a caution, a wariness. There's a consequence from a mixed multitude. Every time. Go to Numbers 11. Again, Numbers 11, 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. Freely? You were, you, they were slaves. 
where they learned that from? A bunch of immigrants coming in, left-wing Democrat, pushing this kind of ideology upon American citizens that they're all brainwashed and they're saying, oh, uh, you're taking away our freedom now. Is this eye-opening to you or what, man? This is, this is pure wickedness of the day and age that we're living in. We're going to go to the book of Hosea, please. Okay, Hosea chapter 7. We're going to go to Hosea chapter 7. Now, look at verse 8. Thank you. Good teaching. Verse 8. I know it's not popular, but that's my tendency is to tend to go against the culture. Okay? Tend to go against the culture, what's normal, if I want to go by the word of God. We're going to look at Hosea chapter 7, and then we'll read verse 8. Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. Okay, look at that. The Bible says about Ephraim immigrating, integrating, mixing himself. Why? Why is that intended? Because you can destroy government, verse 7. They are all hot as an oven and have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth unto me. Look at verse 9. Strangers. Strangers have what? Devoured his strength. When you let strangers in, they take advantage of you and eat up your strength, your integrity. That is the intention of immigration all the way from when? B.C.'s Genesis. Okay. Before even the church, before Jesus was even born, for crying out loud. Yeah. How can this part of human nature be so easily forgotten after uh, 4,000 years of history? Yeah. What men never learn from history is that men stink and never learn from history. Right. All right, go to Genesis 34. You know why? All the devil has to do is for you not to read that book. That's it. It's that simple. You don't read the Bible. You just watch news media, what they say, what the garbage your, your professors say, and then you easily forget everything that was taught 4,000 stinking years ago. Our normalcy and this stuff that we hear is shocking, makes us uncomfortable, should show you how ingrained and brainwashed we are, and it should upset you. It should upset you. Why do I feel uncomfortable when pastor is giving statements like this? Shouldn't this be something that we should know as basics from 4,000 years ago? Why do we feel so uncomfortable? Because we've been normalized to this culture and blinded by this culture where we haven't looked at the Word of God for thousands of years. All right, let's go to Genesis 34. Genesis 34. All right, we're going to look at verse 24, verse 24. And unto Hamor and unto Shechem his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of his city. So the men, they hearkened, they listened to Hamor and Shechem his son. Uh, that, and these are the men who went out of the gate of the city to hear them speak. And every male was circumcised, all that went out of the gate of his city. So then as they left the gate of uh, Hamor city, all those men got circumcised. So Simeon and Levi, that was their plan, their tactic. When they're circumcised, they become weak, so then they can kill them. Verse 25, and it came to pass on the third day, so the th it just so happened on the third day when they were sore, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. So while the people were sore from circumcision, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, who are Dina's brothers, they rallied up the men and had every man his sword, and then they came to the city with boldness, because they were stark, raven, mad. They weren't scared, all right? They were bold. And then they slaughtered all the men. Verse 26, And they slew Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dina out of Shechem's house and went out. 
So then they slew, they killed Hamor and Shechem, his son, uh, with the edge of the sword. That's a, a phrase which obviously you all know, by the blade of the sword, they killed them. Then they took Dina out of Shechem's house and then they went out. So they left the city. Now, that one is probably, that, that one's a little bit, took Dina out of Shechem's house. You notice that? So there are several things here that is very alarming to me. If you think Shechem is honorable and romantic, why did he keep her in his house? So there are several possibilities here. One, if we're going to give him as much benefit of the doubt, is that if we're going to make him as, I'm going to put him as much positive light as possible, is that he was overtly impulsive and wanted to marry her quickly. So he took Dina to his house. And as soon as he got circumcised, he's saying, I'm going to marry you immediately real soon. Wow, what a guy to rely on for the next 20 years of your life, ain't it? So that's the most positive light. The worst case is, after he raped her, he kept her prisoner. Okay. So either or, he's a bad dude, and you, don't wanna, uh, you ladies don't want this guy to be your future husband for the next 20 years. All right, verse 27. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. So Simeon and Levi, who are Jacob's son, they came, uh, they came upon the slain, all the people that got killed, took their spoils and spoiled the whole city. Why? Because they corrupted their sister Dina. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. So that should be self-explanatory. They took the sheep, they took the oxen, they took the donkeys, and then everything that was in the city, everything that was in their field, all their wealth, even their children, their wives, they took captives for themselves and they spoiled everything that was in their home. Uh, that's a danger if you want to be if you want to integrate and then you want to try to gain the wealth for yourself, you just might be tricked one day because those elitists are trying to take advantage of you and just want to make slaves out of you and take all your goods. Okay? Be careful. Be careful. Never uh, one policy that I've learned from my dad, it might not be a good policy, but it's been very safe. It's been very helpful and safe to me is don't trust anybody. <laughs> that helped me I mean uh, that's how we uh, I'll be honest that's how I survived yep. in this community yep. okay I don't trust our government I don't trust my school you know I don't trust this area because you never know what mankind is capable of doing now I'm not saying that I'm totally distrusting people you know and then I'm like oh, I can't trust uh, so and so to do this and that no there's always levels of trust but you should always have inside your heart, not this nonchalant, uh, this, um, oh, oh, I just lost the word, but basically this innocent mindset, we're gullible, be so gullible to people, okay? You don't want to be gullible, okay? Let's see right here at verse 30. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. What does that mean? So Jacob says to Simeon and Levi, Hey, you, uh, you troubled me. You made me stink among all the people who lived in this land. So that's a metaphor. My testimony, my reputation is a stench now to this community. Among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. So those are the people who lived in that land. And Jacob mourns, he whines, because I am few in number. I don't have a lot of people. So they're gonna, the Canaanites, Perizzites will assemble themselves, gather themselves together, and they're going to attack me and then kill me. And I will be destroyed, me and everyone in my home. 
That's the idea. Verse 31, and they said, should he deal with our sister as with an harlot? Simeon and Levi responds to Jacob, hey, then should we deal with them? Uh, should Shechem deal our sister, treat our sister like a harlot, like a whore? That's the bottom line with Shechem, the romantic dude. See that? He took advantage of her. He treated her as a whore. Women, don't be someone's whore, okay? Because that's what this uh, world is teaching you. So uh, I know I'm really slamming today, but 34 is very rich about our culture. You know why it's very rich about our culture? There's no, uh, there's no God involved here. When you have a society that's completely humanism, which is, the res which is 34, it matches our culture very well today. So that's why I'm slamming very hard, because I don't want us to fall into that. So we've seen the fruits of uh, immigration without caution, integration without thinking about the consequences. You got to realize this is that that is helpful when you have that wariness. When I pastored this church, if I had a la di da attitude and didn't think about because we're very integrated, our church. It's like super duper integrated. Like uh, we could summon the one world religion right now if we wanted to. OK, we are very integrated. But I had to think about cultural differences, personalities. I had to have a wariness of that. If I never had that, then uh, our, our fellowship would not be as sweet. Yeah, yeah. Our services would not be as so much in unity. Because you got to realize that uh, it's more comfortable amongst Bible-believing churches in America, where we got a lot of the Baptist heritage from the South, actually. So it's that kind of culture. And then unless I'm a Korean dealing with Korean people or Hispanic dealing with Hispanic people, and there are Bible believers like that, Filipinos dealing with Filipinos, that's fine. But when you're in a liberal San Francisco Bay Area, if you just do this without any wariness, all right, good luck pastoring a church. And if you think that I'm stupid, you take my place, all right? You go ahead and take my place, and then let's see how well you do, okay? So this is so important is you got to see the consequences that can naturally follow, okay? There has to be a caution. You have to see consequences that can come out of that. And then we also see that Jacob, in verse 30, he was scared of the people. But then Jacob does not respond after verse 31. You notice that? Jacob never responded. You know why? Because Simeon and Levi... Uh, they pulled up a smart answer against Jacob, their father. So then, uh, should we let Shechem deal our sister as a whore? Now, that kind of a question, you got to realize, don't you think would convict Jacob? Why would he get convicted? It was his fault to begin with. They ended up in this mess. It was a little bit of himself that he's seeing his boys are doing being deceptive, tricky. What, uh, have you parents ever done that with your children? And then when you're trying to teach them what's right and rebuke them for their wrongdoing, then they give some kind of statement that's a reflection of you. And then it convicts you and you, you don't know what else to say after that. So we have to realize that that's why um, 34 uh, is probably the best chapter for our church people in this culture is to see the result of humanism. We can learn a lot from Jacob. Jacob is a perfect example of a saved believer like us, but who is so used to his own way of doing things and being very smart, intellectual, very humanist about it. Okay, if there's one thing about our culture, it's very intellectual and it's very humanist. Going by their own way of doing things without God. You can learn so much from this chapter. All right, chapter 35. Now let's get out of here, okay? Let's get out of this horrible chapter. 
All right, chapter 35. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Okay, so God, he says to Jacob to arise, that means to get up, and go up to Bethel and to live there and to make an altar to God. That was the place uh, where God appeared to Jacob when he ran away from Esau, his brother, from his face, from his very presence. That's the idea. Okay, so we see at chapter 35, verse 1, that when Jacob goes up to Bethel, God wants him to build an altar. So in other words, God was not pleased with his previous altar. So God was not pleased. So God wanted him to build an altar in Bethel. So you have to get rid of your own altar. Now let me repeat that again, okay? I think this is a very good sermon, all right? I should have preached that sermon, okay? But anyway, so don't make your own altar call. You make an altar call that God wants you to make. That's good. That's good. When you hear the preaching, you don't make your own altar call, your own terms, your own way of worship, your own sacrifice. No, you go by God's terms. All right? You don't come here like a hypocrite. You go to God's altar. Don't make your own altar. Don't build your own altar. You see the fruits of that. Okay? Okay. Uh, anyways. Verse 2, Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean and change your garments. So Jacob says to everyone in his house uh, and everybody that was with him to put away all the idols. That's the idea about the strange gods. So they are strange. They are, if you look at the idols, let's be honest, when you look at them, they look strange, man. So strange gods that are amongst the people, and clean up yourselves, okay, and then change your clothes. Now, this is very good, okay? We can see a lot right here about Bethel. Basically, go to church, house of God. Now, I know that the church building is not necessarily the house of God, but you can call it that way because it's a bunch of believers together. Believers together is a house of God, right? So let's just put it that way, so be gracious to me. But returning to the point right here, if we think of Bethel as our church, going to God's house, having an altar, we need to build an altar not on our own terms, but to God, all right? Another thing we can learn right here is that the, the idols are put away from your life. When you go to the altar, that's the idea. You clear your idols, right? So why did idolatry spread among Jacob's people? Where did they get that from? Where did they pick that up from? So Rachel's, she stole the gods, remember? Do you remember that one? If we go back to chapter 31, chapter 31. Now, isn't it interesting that uh, Jacob says right here, in verse 32, Jacob says, With whomsoever thou findest thy gods, let him not live. Wait a minute. So Jacob's confident that these gods won't be found amongst his people. Then why all of a sudden, chapter 35, there's a whole bunch of gods? So this is proof that Rachel's action, when she hid the gods away from Jacob, it grew. And it was all her fault. It came from Rachel. So we look at verse uh, 34. Rachel was the one who hid them. Now Rachel had taken the images and put them in the camel's furniture and sat upon them. Yeah. Okay, going back right here. Going back right here. That's the problem with say believers is that when they rely on their humanist ways like Rachel did and then pick up the humanist practices and they have their own idols they didn't clear out, it spreads like a plague. Okay, Another thing is when they go to church or when they go to worship God, they change from their casual clothes to special clothes. Now, I don't know if you heard me correctly, but yes, they change from their casual clothes to special clothes. Now, I would like to ask you this. Is that, uh, are you in your casual clothes or are you in your special clothes? See, that's the thing. 
There is no verse in the Bible that gives a specific dress code that you have to wear a tie or something like that. You go to other countries, they don't do that, all right? Uh, I don't know if they still do this, but, you know, because <laughs> Scotland and it's the modern century, but, you know, those men, they wore the skirts, you know. And then there are other cultures that would wear the gowns rather than, you know, a buttoned-up shirt and pants. So the Bible never gave a specific dress code for that reason. Why? God's dressing is not European Caucasian style of dressing. But here's the thing that's important. The reason why we dress this way is because we know that in this society, in this culture, this is known as proper dressing, as professional dressing, people that they respect. It's not a casual, normal way of dressing. People, when they go to church, they just want to come in as they are casual dressing. I am not, uh, I am not a believer in that. I am a believer that when you come to worship God, Jacob from the B.C.s, what, 2,000, 4,000 years ago, even had the common sense that when we worship God, we have to clean up ourselves, okay? There's a reason why that I clean up like this, rather than just coming out of bed and go to church. All right, I have to clean up, do all this stuff. Why? Because I am going to worship God. All right, that's why we're strong believers in that. And again, that's a thing that's against the normalcy of our, uh, that's the normalcy of modern church society now. Modern church society that we need to clear away. If people have common sense to dress well for a job interview or, uh, you know, for a graduation or prom or even s sexual Hollywood itself or the Golden Globe Awards, I do not understand why they don't think that way with God. That's something you have to understand, okay? That's the reason why I'm a very strong believer that, you know, it's not just casual clothes, all right? I mean, if we have, there's a common sense in there that we all know, that we dress our best when it comes to something very special. It shows how much church is not special to you then, okay? So we have to understand that. Okay, let's look at chapter 35 and then verse... Uh, Ah, uh, let me show you uh, one more verse that can demonstrate this. Okay, go to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 12, 2 Samuel 12. David even knew that he is supposed to change his dressing. So not just his usual clothes that he wears, but the special clothes when he worships God. We're going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, and then we'll look at verse 20. 2 Samuel 12 and verse 20. The Bible says, uh, Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. So notice right here that uh, David, when he goes to worship God, he changes his clothes, okay? He changes his clothes. Okay, going back to Genesis 34, Genesis 34. Now, our church is not a Mormon church. We are not a typical IFB church where we do all the do's and don'ts of the dress codes, okay? Because every man and woman here is big enough and adult enough to grow up and understand, all right? We don't believe in legalism, okay? We're not Pharisaical, Sadduceical. However, we are biblical, so at least this much I can say to you. Okay, so all this is stated not out of legalism because I, uh, I am very much against legalism. Okay, we believe that I let the Holy Spirit work on your heart. I let the preaching of the word of God and then the love of the brethren and do my part, okay, and let the Lord deal with you. But if there's something that I come across and I have to preach it from the word of God, I ain't going to play tiddly wings with you and I have to talk about that part, okay? So... You know, for some weird reason, today's study is not a very popular study. I, I, I've been kicking a lot against uh, our culture today, okay? So, all right then, moving on. I think that's the end, so if that's any good news for you, okay? So I think that's the end, so I, I say I think, we'll see. Verse 3, And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the day which I went. Self-explanatory, Jacob tells the people, let's all get up and we're going to go up to Bethel and we're going to make an altar to God there. And God's the one who answered me at the day of my distress when I was in trouble and he was with me 
all the way wherever I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. So notice right here that all the strange gods that were in their hands, they gave it to Jacob and all their earrings as well in their ears, they gave to Jacob. And then he put them underneath the oak. So it shows right here, if the earrings were also given, Jacob, uh, he simply mentioned right here about verse 2, the idea was just uh, putting away the strange gods. So there might be something to the earrings that have to do with paganism. Or it could be, which might be even more interesting, listen up now, is in verse 2 when he said, change your garments. So even they knew that the earring that they wore was not proper when they worshiped the Lord. Now, this one I don't know too much about, but I do know this is that uh, in the Bible, Proverbs mentions about that earring, wearing an earring is not a sin, actually. In their culture, earrings were normal. But then right here, these people had the conviction that they had to clean up their earrings. Now, what's the bottom line to that? The bottom line is this, is that God is truly not specific in dress codes. All right? He doesn't give specific in dress codes. But people do know deep down inside their heart is that the item that they're dressing in that is not pleasing to the Lord and they need to change it. Okay, there you go. All right. So don't use uh, John Wesley as your excuse, man, to keep having long hair. OK, <laughs> because even uh, just like the verse says, e wearing an earring is not a sin. It's honor. But to these people at Genesis 35, they knew it was a sin. All right, don't pull up an excuse for the way you dress. All right, you know deep down inside your heart what your strange God is. And let's be honest, your strange God is your dressing, all right? We live in that kind of society right now. So I find that passage extremely interesting that they got rid of their earrings too, not just their idols. So they knew inside their heart that the way they dressed was not pleasing to the Lord when they worshiped him. All right, verse 5. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So as they were, journey, uh, as they were making their journey up to Bethel, they're leaving uh, Shechem's territory. So notice right here, the, uh, Jacob hid them, uh, all these strange gods, by the oak uh, in Shechem. So Shechem, remember, is the name of the person. And uh, we already saw right here different names of the city, which is not a surprise. Sometimes one city can have multiple names. The owner of the territory could call that place after him as well, all right? Or it could be referring uh, to Shechem's territory. That's the idea. So in verse 5, as they were making their journey, God's terror was on the cities that were surrounding them. So Shechem's people, they were all scared and the cities that knew Shechem, okay? And the cities that knew about the slaughter of Shechem and his people, they didn't dare to pursue after the sons of Jacob. They left them be. Okay, so verse 6 through 29, I will cover next Genesis study. I'm very surprised that uh, I only covered this much. I thought I would cover the whole chapter. I was just too much in concentration mode against our culture. Okay, let's pray. Uh, Father, I pray that today's Genesis study uh, was not an offense to the hearers, but a blessing, and that the people will see that I have their best intentions in heart. It's not something deliberate, but it's simply from your word and what you want to say, and what you want these people to hear. And I pray that the people will see that in this uh, wicked day and age where we may we not follow the ways of this society, but your own ways, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.